Hassan Rouhani. This is the first time leaders from the United States and Iran have talked since the 1979 Iranian Revolution. The possibility of a meeting between the two leaders caused major speculation during the United Nations General, General Assembly earlier this week. Just now, I spoke on the phone with President Rouhani of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The two of us discussed our ongoing efforts to reach an agreement over Iran's nuclear program. I reiterated to President Rouhani what I said in New York. While there were, will surely be important obstacles to moving forward, and success is by no means guaranteed, uh, I believe we can reach a comprehensive solution. President Obama in the United States has been on record saying that it will not allow Iran to develop the means to make nuclear weapons. Iran said its nuclear program is designed for peaceful energy programs. Rouhani confirmed the phone conversations in a series of Twitter messages, saying in one that, quote, in regards to nuclear issue with political will, there is a way to rapidly solve this matter. Joe Cerincioni, Plowshares, Fund president and author of the forthcoming book, Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World, It's Too Late, joins me tonight on the program. Joe, good to have you with us. Thank you, uh, what is, what? How, how big is this conversation, uh, th this move forward between the two leaders of countries that haven't spoken in 30 years? Yeah, this is, they made history today. Most Americans were not alive. The last time an Iranian leader met with the President of the United States, that was Jimmy Carter, who met with the Shah of Iran back in, in 1977. The median age in the United States is 36, so, so half the population wasn't even born then. So Obama is breaking that ice, breaking that, uh, that barrier between the two countries. A small step, but a very significant step. It not only establishes a direct connection between the two presidents, it empowers the national security apparatus of of both countries to go make what both presidents say they want, a deal. Yeah. Joe, who's responsible for the connection? Who picked up the phone? Who arranged it? How did this come about? Do you know anything? Well, I do. You know, the, the two sides were very close to meeting up in New York, and it, they had agreed to meet, and then they realized that they didn't have enough time to actually assure a positive outcome of the meeting, a tangible result of the meeting, and decided it was more important to show results than to, than to have a, a handshake. And, but it, behind the scenes, the two were conferring, and it became clear that uh, President Rouhani would be receptive to a phone call, President Obama then, who had extended the hand of friendship to Iran back in his first inauguration, then made the phone call, caught the president as he was on the car, in his car, driving to the airport to return to Iran. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a moment in a, in a quite remarkable week. Well, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, the United States has been solid in its position on the nuclear potential of the Iranians. Has been no shift at all in our policy when it comes to Iran. So this is movement on their part, or is that an overreach? Well, the, the election of President Rouhani, he was elected in, in June of this year, was a clear mandate from the Iranian people to fix the economy, to do something about the economy, a clear break with the failed policies of the previous president, Ahmadinejad, who had an eight, eight miserable years, drove the economy into a ditch. U.S. sanctions are crippling the Iranian economy. The only way Rouhani can fix this is to ease the sanctions. The only way he can do that is to limit the nuclear program. So that's the deal. It's not a matter of trusting each other. It's a matter of negotiating a contract. You accept real limits on your nuclear program, verifiable limits, and we will start relaxing the tensions. And then that opens the way for what you heard the president talk about, a comprehensive arrangement. We have overlapping strategic interests in the region, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, the fight against al-Qaeda, an opponent of both countries. U.S.-Iranian cooperation on a nuclear deal could pave the way for strategic cooperation that could greatly benefit U.S. interests in the entire region. Joe, how does this play into the chemical weapon issue with the Syrians? It's Seeing very, that the, the, two, the, the, the two allies of uh, Assad, obviously, are the Iranians and the Russians. This, this, is, uh, this is a rough day at the office for the Syrians, isn't it? 
but, but uh, uh, Syria has been Iran's only ally in the region, but it's crumbling. And you can see their interest in Assad making a deal for two reasons. One, they want Assad to give up the chemical weapons. Iranians, as the president mentioned in his speech at the uh, UN, were gassed by the tens of thousands by Iraqi chemical weapons. And so they're, they're against having those chemical weapons. They're glad to see them go. And they think this might give a lifeline to Assad. We want to get rid of the chemical weapons. and we we can negotiate at least a ceasefire in the region. So now you have the U.S. negotiating with Russia, with Iran's backing over Syria. Again, these overlapping strategic interests. Not identical. Neither side is doing the other favors. But for their own strategic national security interests, they're mm -hmm. willing to negotiate a deal. You can do it in Syria. That overlaps gives you confidence that you can do it on the bigger issue, the Iranian nuclear program. You see the All diplomatic right, that, that wheels in motion. That's the diplomatic semantics of it all. What's the politics of all of this? How is this going to be received on Capitol Hill? You have, both presidents are being very careful here. Both have conservative opponents at home that are waiting to accuse them of appeasement, of being weak, of being naive. So they're taking small steps. So they couldn't do the handshake. They did the phone call. You can hear, you, can, you, can, you know that uh, the president's critics on Capitol Hill are going to use this to fit into their meme of the president. He's weak, he's dangerous, doesn't know what he's doing, doesn't care about America's national security. He might not even be American. You know, so you know that attack is coming, but the American people are very clear. They don't want any more wars in the Middle East. They want us to yeah. disengage from these wars, not start, start them. Obama's got American public opinion, the national security leadership, the U.S. military on his side here. That's probably enough. Can we speculate how the Iranian people and the Persian culture will accept this? You know, I've been to Tehran. I actually met Rouhani in 2005 when he was the nuclear negotiator. Any American who goes to, goes to Iran will tell you the Iranian people like us. They like Americans. They wear blue jeans. They drive motorcycles. They listen to American rock and roll. We have a higher popularity rating in Iran than we do in Pakistan. So the Iranian people want an end to this isolation. They want, it, they want an economy. They got a 50% unemployment rate among, among the youth. They want out. They want to be friends again with the United States. Well, Hani understands that. As president, he understands that, and he's trying to make that happen. There's a lot of obstacles. There's a long way to go. Who, but we saw a strategic turn this week that is setting us on an entirely new course with Iran. And, and who makes the next move? The next move will take place in Geneva. That's where Secretary of State John Kerry will meet October 15th and 16th with Foreign Minister mm -hmm. Gerard, Gerard Zarif. They both of them have been empowered by their respective presidents to, uh, to make a deal. It turns out it wasn't the handshake that was important. It was the handoff. These two guys can make a deal. We'll see the first inkling of that in two weeks. All right. Joe Serencioni, great to have you with us tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank